Felicia Day is a screenwriter, actor, and author who dazzled audiences in the early days of web series with The Guild, a loving satire of World of Warcraft addiction, then wowed audiences as Penny and Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog, then entranced audiences, or absolutely me, as King of Forrester in the recent incarnation of Mystery Science Theater 3000. This summary omits over 100 IMD credits as an actor. Besides writing The Guild and being a writer on Mystery Science Theater, she's the author of You're Never Weird on the Internet, Almost, a memoir, and the self-help book Embrace Your Weird, Face Your Fears, and Unleash Creativity. Her newest piece is an epic yet comic fantasy audiobook, Third Eye. Laurel thought she was fulfilling her destiny when she faced off in a magic battle with the evil wizard Tybus, but she was very wrong. Her magic shop, Third Eye, now a tourist trap in San Francisco with a vampire and fairy as tenants, is the locus of many complications after a normie full of secrets passes through its doors, seeking Laurel as a magical mentor. Many painful and hilarious complications ensue. Third Eye is presented like a radio play with voice actors that include Will Wheaton, Felicia Day herself, and uh, this new person to the scene, Neil Gaiman, as the narrator. I can attest that this story has immense wit and heart, my favorite cocktail of reading and listening sensation. Felicia, welcome to the Drunken Odyssey. Sean, thank you. You know, can I take that summary and use it? Because it was probably the best summary of Third Eye that I've heard. And I was like, oh, I really like that line. Who wrote that? It must, it was not in the copy. So thank you. <laughs> well, some of it's slightly cribbed from, yeah, the audible uh, summary, but. Um, you gave it your magic. Uh, yeah, well, I, you know, I, I condensed it. Great. Well, you did a great job. I I, I'm, I'm really it. wonderful at, yeah, helping write copy after it's no longer needed. I'm, I'm, I'm an expert at that. Listen, the hardest thing to write is a summary of the back of a DVD or just a one. It really is the hardest thing. And sometimes when I'm stuck writing, I just force myself to write a synopsis that's that short. And it really gets you to figure out what the heck you're writing because sometimes you're just lost. And if you have to distill it, into like a really concentrated broth like that, you you're, you can't get lost as much. Well, I've also found that helpful when we're trying to actually write the thing itself. If I feel yeah, stuck that's what I meant. Yeah, and I can't get in scene, then it's like okay, what's the bigger picture? And then eventually my brain relaxes and I, I'll be writing scene. Uh, yeah, so actually, I need to do that on my next project, which I still haven't started writing, which plagues me with guilt right now. So thank you for that. Well. <laughs> Maybe I can coach you along with that and you can coach me along with mine. Okay, great. I like it. So I love Third Eye and in part, you know, it's an audiobook. It, it's basically a, a like a dramatic podcast, except done at, I think, the highest possible level. And it just, it hits all the sweet spots for me. Oh. And, you know, ultimately the story works, even though this is very comic, like, um, there are real moments of tenderness and there, you know, like there are moments that matter, even though the characters are sublimely ridiculous. Uh, it's true. <laughs> and that's my favorite thing is, is comedy that is both very dark, but also somewhere in there is hard. And this, oh, this seems like it's not the, uh, you know, like I think Douglas Adams kind of created a science fiction version of that as as a brand that you know after the first one like oh yeah i recognize that but i i feel like you know this isn't uh the most obvious project out of the gate i don't know like this it this feels like a very professional version of a diy project <laughs> well uh, that i Holly, mean <laughs> like hollywood and traditional publishing would not have said oh yes this is this is the straightforward thing to do yeah. Um, no, you're totally right. Like I couldn't get this sold as a television series and it exists because Audible took a chance and was like, yeah, fantasy comedy, because it's a very hard sell. I think uh, Taika Watiti has actually made this tone acceptable in some ways where it wasn't before what we do in the shadows, which came out after I actually pitched the show a couple of years before that show came out. Um, it opened the door to being a little bit more absurd with genre, although it's a grand tradition in British comedy, as you mentioned, Douglas Adams, but like Faulty Towers and Blackadder and, you know, mixing historical genre, Red Dwarf, it certainly isn't uh, unfamiliar to more the UK audience, but like for 
for some reason, we like our comedy super grounded here and mostly male driven. And yeah, it would not ever have gotten made. I doubt it gets, I don't know, maybe it would be nice if it became a TV show, but even having the proof of concept here where it works, you never know. It is a genre that's kind of tricky in Hollywood. But at the end of the day, I'm just so glad I got to write it. And um, you're right. Like, uh, I think it was kind of marketed as an audio book, but it really is a TV show for, you know, audio. And that was what I intended it. And that's how I wrote it in a screenplay format. But it ter turned out to be the length of an audio book. And a lot of the marketing around it is more audio book. So it is, it's, it's a weird world to live in, but again, I wanted to tell the story and I was going to tell it however I could. And I, I really am grateful to be able to do it in this high a production level with this amazing cast. Well, if this becomes a TV show or film series, I would be anxious because I feel like I've already had the perfect third eye experience. <laughs> um, I you know, am, I agree with you. I think, I mean, it, at least it would be this, this would be the version I'm like, I'm very happy with this. If it had to get changed to be adapted to something else. Um, I'm just glad this, my artistic heart is satisfied it exists this way. So thank you for that. Well, I, I also think, all right. It, and, and I hate to side with Hollywood ever, you know, but I think the special effects that would be required, maybe, uh, you know, like I just have some anxiety about that. Like, okay. Yeah. Could this be executed at a level it deserves mm -hmm. with the budget they would likely give it? And, you know, if if so, well, then I would be ecstatic. But I also like I would be biting my nails because as a fan, I feel like I have now like a parasocial relationship with this, <laughs> this product. Like you're you're like invested I'm, in the adaptation. I'm, I got I'm emotionally you want to come invested. On as a producer. I, I appreciate that. I mean, listen, I've been in Hollywood a long time. And part of the reason I actually took time off many years, actually, this took I mean, I, I pitched this in 2016, I think, at the end of 2015 and 2016. So this is a long gestated process. Um, and I ended up writing it all over COVID. So by the time I started writing this, it was 2019 and COVID just hit. And I basically wrote it all the way over COVID and we recorded it in the fall of 2022. And it's out a year later. So uh, it has been a long, long, long process. But at the end of the day, I just, I couldn't let go of this idea that you know, in a way, Harry Potter fails. And what do you do with your life after you after you fail? Um, I don't even like saying Harry Potter as a comparison because I'm not really a fan of the author's uh, personality right now. But at the same time, that was a little bit of an inspiration because you have this chosen one that sort of permeates our, uh, our sort of fantasy world. And if you kind of subvert that, what does that do? What it, it breaks everything that we've been taught about fantasy. And I just really wanted to see what happened. Well, it also, I think, flips the dynamic of Harry Potter and that, okay, what if Harry Potter at the beginning of that story knew he was supposed to be the chosen one? Like uh, the reason why he's considered a chosen one is accidental or incidental. And like, it was like, he was a baby. Like there was nothing he did. Yeah. Um, so but that... that's kind of like what people, how people raise their children now. It's like you're you're inherently special, yeah. and if you exhibit any talent whatsoever in one thing, the parents like jump on it, and it's like, well, this is you now. <laughs> and it's really hard as a parent not to do that because you want to encourage them and you you want to see any advantage that they might have in life. But at the same time, you can't just make them one thing. And I think that was kind of what I wanted to talk about a little bit in that um, kind of a, a failed prodigy in a sense, which we have in real life and in fantasy. And, you know, th that's a very real dynamic because to be excellent at music or dance or usually art, like most of the fine arts, if you don't start very, very early before, you know, you even like it. <laughs> it's true. I started playing the violin at two and a half and I got a scholarship to college. I was very, 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 very good. I could have definitely been a violinist. I don't know why I became what I did, but uh, I, I was kind of running away from it because again, when it becomes your identity and when that defines you, you don't really have the opportunity to grow in any other way, right? And so that's really um, what I wanted to talk about, like this person finding herself outside of what she's been defined of by, uh, as by every single person around her. Well, and it requires a certain Zen to like the thing that you get paid to do, which is why 
having more than one thing you do, I think helps that because when you're <laughs> frustrated yeah. by one thing or you're just, you don't feel open or free. To That's, true. Then, That's true. Then it just becomes as bad of a job as any other job. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, I am the expert at changing, uh, turning my hobbies into my profession. <laughs> If you see the hyphens in my name, you're like, that girl cannot pick a lane. And I'm like, I can't. I don't know if it's uh, ADD or just like, I just, I, you know, the next projects I have are both stage plays. I'm like, why am I doing this? I don't know, because I haven't done it before. I just have to see. <laughs> uh, I think the phrase is, you're a renaissance woman. Thank you. I like that better than a Jill of all trades, master of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Partly, you know, you you arrived on the scene at a time when technology was opening up and like opened up avenues for entertainment and art that the professional channels hadn't even like before they knew the industry had changed, the industry had changed. So mm -hmm. the guild was you taking this thing that had kind of had a very harmful impact on your life, which is a video game addiction dealing with depression while Hollywood made you like the nerdy best friend or the nerdy like marginal character and everything because uh, they they couldn't figure out what you were great for. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, you can you can swell a progress. You could be part of a team. And eventually you, you know, you, you make a web series. And I have to say, I'm I'm just, you know, and I I didn't play World of Warcraft. I did play Dungeons and Dragons back in the day. Um, once you bought the books, uh, it was cheap. <laughs> 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 like back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. But um, the idea that in a three to seven minute time span, you could tell something like a complete story that was also funny and it looks and sounds professional. And it was very much DIY and 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 just like calling it every favor and um... oh for sure yeah I mean it was very very homegrown but at the end of the day like you said I was really frustrated and I I guess it's my ego it's like why can't I be the star <laughs> why can't somebody who looks like me who has my interests be the central focus of a story and I think it's very hard to get um, Hollywood to see women as anything different than they perceive them. And they meaning mostly white men who kind of see women in a certain way. And unfortunately, um, you know, it, they're just not a lot of nerdy advocates for women out there. I've tried my best and um, still, you know, uh, there are some people who broke through, I think. Um, but it, it, at the end of the day, it isn't like a revolution in how female, you know, characters are being portrayed. And I just won't give up. I'm just like, well, you don't want me to star in this? You don't want to cast me as someone who actually has a character arc? Well, I'll just go make it myself. And that's what happens over and over again. And I love working and I will, I actually, you know, have come to the conclusion that as long as I get to tell my stories and I get to be, and I don't even need to be the center of them. I have a graphic novel coming out that has nothing to do with, you know, me and I'm growing away from that, but like, I love to perform. And if I'm not getting the opportunities to do what I really love with Hollywood, I'll just do my own thing on the side and I'll do whatever they'll hire me to do. And the blessing is that because of my rating, you know, I've been able to play some wonderful characters on Supernatural and Eureka and Dr. Horrible. And, you know, that is only as a result of my, you know, really standing up and saying, here I am, here's a character. And the writer's going, wow, it's something fresh. Let's show the world that because I haven't seen that before. And, you know, it hasn't, again, revolutionized anything, but it opened a door for a, a type of character that hopefully will keep opening the door wider and wider for different female roles to be available out there. Maybe I'll put, I'll be in them, maybe not, but you know, might as well just get that door open for being a little bit different as a woman. And you're a nerd, which I, I don't know when this started, but it started long before I knew it had started. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and and that is, you know, uh like so many of the the nerd things that I I love in this world um I I don't know if 
women or girls, I, you know, uh, just eventually crossed over or if they just stopped hiding that they liked these things. And I you realized know, there's, I, I there's a depends. toxic, there's a toxic bro, like sense of ownership around a lot of this stuff, which I just find so fucking boring. Um, like among others, like, yes, there's, it's, it's awful and criminal in many <laughs> cases. Um, well, I, I think that at, I think at the end of the day, I think scientists have proven that if you form a, an idea about the world, it's very hard to unlearn that world. And so it, it's it's very it's very hard for you to change and especially change without feeling like you're being deprived of something that was yours, um, either your power or your position as a person. And so I think that as society sort of moves on, people get more conservative, especially the older they are, because they think, well, that's not how my world works. Why are you trying to change my world? It worked perfectly well for me, right? And the wonderful thing is, I think that the it's not like the nerd geek world has become undermined because there are people who are more diverse, who are interested in it. In fact, I think all of our creativity has gotten more interesting and we're able to tell uh, more varied stories that attract more people who have very different, you know, and then grown it and allowed more artists to thrive and make livings and tell more stories. So it all helps each other. But again, at the end of the day, some people are still feeling like they're being encroached upon and what they understood the world was like and their position in it is being undermined somehow. And I guess, you know, yes, there's a lot of bad behavior, but, you know, the best thing to do is just be able to show up and represent and 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 show people that you're not you're not what what you love is not disappearing because other people love it now um and that's what i've always tried to do you know i could very easily i had a, a company called geek and sundry and i was pressured quite strongly to do it uh make it a, a female geek brand early on and i said i don't want to do that i just want to have my brand and be a female leading it and so that everybody will feel included but it'll have my voice in it. And my voice tends to be a little bit more, you know, me, maybe feminine. I don't, I wouldn't even describe it as that, but it's different from what a typical nerd or geek voice would be. Um, maybe because of my gender, maybe because of who I am. So I, I probably would have made a better business decision, like making it a little cleaner and saying, this is a female geek brand. But at the end of the day, we made some wonderful things that impacted everybody altogether, because at the end of the day, that's what we should all be ideally. And this is not just, I think, a lesson about uh, women taking ownership of their careers and and not limiting their vision to just what seems to be available. Um, you know, I, I think this is this should be true for for all creatives, which is mm -hmm. okay. Try and merge with the uh, the academic term is discourse community. Try and merge with the profession. Um, see what it, it it can do for you. But if it doesn't seem interested in the things that you're really passionate about, then make your own thing. Well, that's the wonderful thing about the times we live in. Like if we were living in the 80s or 50, 1950s or 100 years ago, like nobody would be able to tell these stories. And there was no avenue, right? They were all, I mean, yeah, there's self-publishing. There was self-publishing before the internet, but the access to that was so um hard for people so it, it you know we live in a world of plenty now uh, and it's almost too overwhelming and people can't get their stories out there and that's hard but at the end of the day you have an avenue to reach one person that you would never have been able to reach before and it's great whether it's a TikTok or a web series when those were made or uh, a novel that you self-publish or an audio project like I did like they're all sorts of ways to reach people and tell your stories and that's what really, you know, fuels me because yes, it would be great to have a great budget. It would be great to have stars in it. It would be wonderful to pay my friends and not just call them mm -hmm. and ask them another favor. <laughs> uh, that would be so cool. I made it a lot of stuff and it is still tires me out um, to ask that. But at the end of the day, I'm making something and I it wouldn't get made otherwise. And I know that there are a lot of fans out there who are enjoying Third Eye and having it, you know, fill a niche that they would never get on TV. And that's, you know, that's the business I like to be in, telling my own stories like that. So in 1988, I saw ACDC and they fired a cannon off indoors 
to, uh, uh, for the closing of their show. And my left ear has been ringing ever since. So, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> audi- so, audiobooks, like, it is a, like, so for me, there is no quiet ever. Oh, <laughs> like, that's I'm just, so sorry. That's, that's not available to me. Uh, well, you've helped by making Third Eye because, like, when I could put the earbuds in and sort of help control the, the sound going into my head. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's for me a, a great audiobook is a special experience. And and so this one, there are sound effects, there's you know, like when someone's walking away talking, like someone is literally walking away from a microphone. And you know Well, I will say that the company that helped us do all the post-production mumble, they are out of San Francisco and their attention to detail was just stunning. And uh, when I got the post-production schedule, we recorded last uh, October, November. And when I got the post-production schedule that said that we would not turn in final episodes until July, I was like, what are you talking about? I've seen movies with hundreds of special effects get done in less than six months. What is going on? And yet when we got into it, we definitely need that time. And it was so important to figure out like in every scene, because especially when you're painting a whole world and with action and magic and physicality, um, you really can't have any confusion. You have to be super, super clear on what's going on. You don't want your audience to go out of the story and be like, what, who's talking? What's going on? Right. Where are they in the room? What room they in? What just happened? Was it a fireball? Who's knowing? So like it, <laughs> it was the, the biggest learning curve was figuring out how to translate me as a visual writer, because I've written mostly for, you know, video, to be, you know, uh, communicable in audio form. And the, the, you know, the, the easiest fix was to add Neil Gaiman as the narrator or just a narrator who happens to be played by Neil Gaiman. That was, you know, one part, but that was not all of it. It was really taking every single scene and being like, okay, can a sound effect convey this? Do we need one of the actors to call out what happened in addition to that? So no one's, um, you know, confused. How exactly is, you know, this being executed. How do we make this feel like this is more active? Can we add a fork time here in this dinner scene to make this joke work? Every single scene had to be analyzed like that about placement and action and all of that. And it just took so much longer than I thought on on top of like soundtrack, which Mumble again was incredible at. So I have to say it was a much bigger team and a much bigger effort and a longer process than I ever could have imagined. But the results are are phenomenal. Well, thank you. I mean, I definitely put four years of work into this. I probably shouldn't have, <laughs> but when I do something, I do it like as good as I can. <laughs> well, as I said before, uh, you know, a, a, at the start, yeah. Um, if your name is high up in the credits of anything, I I I I, I assume it's quality. Oh, I appreciate um, that. That. Um, there's something about either you as a creator or you and the projects that you, you know, participate in, um, where there's a there there that it's not simply <laughs> transaction. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the one of the you know when I when I, I I originally wrote a pilot for this just the first half hour, and when I went to turn it into a long form, I was like, whoa, this is seven hours of content, and I'm writing a comedy. And I'm like, how do I get somebody to care about a comedy for seven hours? Like, it's funny, you know, in five minute chunks, Mm -hmm. it's okay in 22 minute chunks, but like, how do I build a narrative that takes this very sick commie tone and make it, you know, make a through line that people care about for seven hours. And it was, you know, that was really the dig in hard work. And I, you know, I am not an easy writer. There is nothing about my process that is like smooth or, you know, I'm not pooping out words and just going, oh, there's a screenplay. Like, no, I'm a very constipated <laughs> writer. Okay. And I have to, I have to think about it. And I, I have 8 million things other going on and I don't get to it. And then I feel guilty about that. And it's just, um, it's not an easy process, but like having the silence of the world shutting down finally deprived me of all the things that usually distract me. And made me feel like you got to work on something that means something to get away from what's going on in the world. And so, um, yeah, it was, it's very interesting, like tone wise, 
um, how you get comedy to sustain over that long. And I'm really, you know, I, I'm very proud about mostly how the performers and the story got through people through that. Well, I, you know, for me, the heart, even though like a lot of it, it's submerged much of the time yeah. because, uh, because jokes, because uh, the, the dramatic humor of just all of these characters. So in the, this was something I learned writing a comic novel, which is I had these dramatic elements. And then like my peers in workshop said, your main character is risking his life. Maybe his friends shouldn't be telling jokes. And then I thought, oh, I'll be damned. Okay. I have to, oh, it, like you, you care about the story in the story. Yeah. So could you talk a little bit more about the story in the story and the serious structure that's at, at, at play? Because despite how ridiculous these characters are, ultimately, um, like this is a story that matters. Yeah, I mean, that's funny that you say that because the 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 hardest process and the last process in the dialogue editing was me cutting out jokes that seemed to undermine. Um, mm -hmm. So there are a couple of main characters who pass away. Well, there's a main character who passes away. I don't want to give any spoilers, but like being able to have the character's relationship and people's reaction to that death be genuine was really hard and I ended up lifting a lot of jokes and a lot of lines because I was like well, you know what I don't think she'd joke right now and being able to really make those impacts um uh, work and you know when I was outlining I had to out I, I got to outline all 10 uh episodes um as one and that's funny because the six seasons I wrote the gill which was over seven years that is about the same amount I wrote for this third eye so <laughs> it was a lot to take on at once but it also is a privilege in that you can really craft an arc that is consistent and uh, you could track. And for me, it was all about the relationships. And it was specifically about Laurel and Kate, the young girl who comes into the failure's life, Laurel, who I play, and being able to track their relationship. And some sometimes it was a little bit of plot that would, you know, put a twist in the relationship. But most of the time it was their flaws, right? And especially Laurel's flaw. Um, that would force a problem to happen. And I did that with all of the arcs, you know, between Frank and uh, Tracy, which is another kind of pairing that happens in the show a little bit later in the season. Frank the and, vampire and a woman so weird, he falls in love with her. Yeah, she's so gothic and antiquated that he falls in love with her. Yeah, and then we have Sybil and Robigus. Robigus played by Will Wheaton and Sybil played by London Hughes, a hilarious uh, comic, um, they have sort of a very weird relationship of on and off again, because uh, he's a bad guy and Sybil is my best friend and he torments me. So it's it's a little bit awkward, but like really taking those, I think you could have taken my outline and written a drama from the outline. But unfortunately, my tone of voice is always a little absurd and a little broad. And when Jonah Ray, who who actually is in Mystery Science Theater, who directed me there, starred in it, and also he directed this, voice directed it. He read it and he was like, this is the most Felicia thing I've ever read. And it's like, thank you, because it really is the tone of what I write. But again, if you took just the bare beats that I had done outline wise, you could have written a dra dramatic version of it and mm -hmm. it would totally work. And I think that was really an interesting discovery on my part that you know, story and character are going to be consistent throughout any kind of tone. And that is a, that is a different, it's a different thing to consider. Just to go back to a point you made earlier, um, Neil Gaiman's tone as a, um, I don't want to say arch Brit because he's not arch, but uh, like he can put on some smarm. So oh, he's that he can so, say something, yes. <laughs> he, can, he could read something like, uh, and, and this is a quote, pause for some world building gobbledygook. And then he can explain something about the, the fantasy world of the story. And the joke is the introduction to that section, not what he's actually telling you about this world. Yeah. Well, he's very snarky. And I think that's why, you know, there was some there was some talk back and forth about do we call him, do we say narrated by Neil Gaiman? But we came to the conclusion that he's not narrating anything. He is the narrator. He is playing yes. a character. And as you get deeper and deeper into the story, he begins more snarky and more self-aware and a little bit 
kind of bitchy towards the writer. <laughs> actually, he did a lot of really cool improv. Some of it did actually end up in here. And then some of it I cut out because it got really mean toward me, you know, not mean, but like it got very snarky. And I was like, I don't know about this. <laughs> But I, I will say that he's a brilliant actor. And the fact that he agreed to do this was the biggest compliment in my life. I will never, I will never have one to top it. And um, he's one of the nicest people you've ever met as well. So I don't know how you have the triumvirate of being a, attractive, the most talented human on earth and being lovely. I don't know. It's too much, too much in one person. Well, and I, I think if, if the narrator were American, I, it's possible you could get something like that effect, but yeah, uh, maybe like Viola Davis so or charming. somebody. He's so charming and and gravita. He has gravitas and charm, which is hard. And of course, he was my ideal person. Um, but you know, you never know if you're going to get them or not. I mean, it's just a fate again, a favor that should not be given. <laughs> oh, but his, his snark doesn't have a tone. Like it's just him. Yeah speaking mellifluously which means your your brain then has to lean in mm -hmm. which uh you know and, and so driving around listening to this uh you know if i accidentally hit the radio and listen to an american commercial which i believe they're written for people who have experienced brain damage <laughs> uh right like it's 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 such a shock so for me uh, you know, Third yeah, Eye was such a wonderful world to inhabit. And oh, thank you. Well, he um, it was very funny because he has a very, I mean, he's a professional. He he reads a lot, mm -hmm. and he has a tone and a pace that's slower than the action because we're all very frenetic, high, yeah, you know, high energy people. And the wonderful thing is that Neil, you know, between scenes, he'll he'll introduce a scene. And then we have a, a sequence of being people being completely frenetic and he just calms the pace down. So it doesn't feel like we're running the whole time. We're just running between scenes and it really makes the piece as far as pace goes. And that's purely a performance thing without him performing. I don't know if it would, I would have made it through seven hours of people being like such high stakes going on, but he really just brings it down to a level where you just settle in and get ready for another like, roller coaster. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about what it's like to write for Mystery Science Theater and what that experience has been like? So uh, by the way, I'm one of the, I might be the world's foremost academic expert on Mystery Science Theater, just in case you didn't know how cool I am. I did not know, I've but that is I published an article wonderful. on um, Mystery Science Theater as a postmodern allegory for media consciousness. Wow. Oh, that's amazing. Well, you know, I think that MST3K is the predecessor to the internet because there was, you know, I remember watching it as a child with my brother. It's the one thing that we could agree on that we wanted to watch on television. And there was the, the breaking of the fourth wall of Joel talking to us as an audience and then also reading letters at the end mm -hmm. was like the coolest thing that I had ever seen on television. And that intimate relationship he had talking to the audience, which you just didn't see in a, a sort of comedic scripted ish format, you know, it just was so or fresh. Adults. No, that felt like, yeah. You know, and, and to some degree, like some kids were watching, but yeah, it was mostly it, adults, but I was watching when I was like eight, cause my mom didn't care what we did, but <laughs> <laughs> it was like the TV's on, you're good. Um, so I, I can't even tell you what a dream it is to be able to, uh, write and act in the show. The only reason I'm on the show is that I saw Joel at a convention in the green room and I went up to take a selfie with him just to rub it in my brother's face and then cut <laughs> to him asking me to be Kinga and then getting my brother and me to co-write on a couple of episodes. It was a dream come true for both of us. And it's a lot harder than you could imagine because I'm sure everybody who watches a movie has a couple snarky comments. God bless you. You're not ready for MST3K because I thought I was as well. But when you're required to like write at least a joke every 10 seconds in a movie yeah. it is so hard especially when there's like minutes long sequences of people just swimming like it really tests your cleverness in a way that i you know i admire some of the writers on that show so much and i can't believe joel 
Uh, I mean, it's just brilliant in every way, but just to sustain a show like that for so long is just incredible. And the show is better or funnier. I saw, uh, so, I mean, I, I've seen the, the Netflix uh, versions and when they toured it live, like I, I went to see it live and I was mm -hmm. just, I was just like, it never stopped being hilarious. Does everyone watch it together? And, and Oh, as far as the writing process. Yeah. yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, Joel and Matt and a couple of other people go through all the stuff that everybody has pit, but it's actually a very scientific process for the first season for Netflix. We all did remote writing and we would just send in our riffs. And I, I think Joel and his team went through all the riffs, you know, they'd go, every five minute chunk and they'd see all the jokes pitched and be like that one that one that one so i can't imagine for last season we did um uh writing rooms so jonah was the showrunner you know running the room for the the ones that i did and we would have eight or nine writers and every day we'd do another 10 minutes and you'd bring all your jokes and we'd you'd just raise your hand on zoom when you had a joke um and they'd be like hey pitch it out and it was so like nerve wracking because you don't know if your joke is going to hit or if it's funny and you kind of don't want to pitch something you, and you hear all these other brilliant jokes and other people know how to do references. Like I never do references that are good and that's like the bread and butter of MST3K so I was like I would feel intimidated but then you know I had video game references that a couple other people would laugh at i'm like yes. So it, it, it was never a competitive environment, it was very like additive and very fun together. And yeah, it, and then at the end of the day, you, some of the producers would go, we would produce like our 10 minutes. So we'd look at the 10 minutes and be like, oh, or 15. And we'd be like, okay, these are the jokes that hit the most and we'll put them in the thing. But then at the end of the day, again, Joel and his team would go through and be like, I don't know if I love that one that the, the producers picked. I want to see what else everybody came up with. So that's essentially how it worked. And, you know, it's a fine, it's a fine mag magic, um, process that they've really honed down. And I really hope we get to do more seasons going forward. Mystery Science Theater does also seem like a forerunner to DIY like entertainment. Um, For sure. The way it started, uh, the puppets were so crude at first, but it kind of, it almost didn't matter. Uh, I mean, I think the latest, how... yeah, I think the latest season is the best because it was a lot more low budget than the Netflix version, but at the same time, it just felt more MST3K. Like we're just showing up, putting on a show in our, in our houses. Like that's, that's, that's what I love about it. And it also, you know, the self-awareness of it makes you mm -hmm. kind of be self-aware of the production of the show, but also the movies that we're looking at. It's like this meta, meta, meta thing. Well, and it made me feel like the thousands of, hours of awful television viewing that I had done in my life somehow had some sort of dividend to pay as jokes that I could then respond to, even though everyone's life would be better if no one knew these references, <laughs> most of them. Anyway, the show is kind of an antidote to what just happens ordinarily with television, or at least what happened with television, you know, up until the 90s i mean if you look it's still here it's yeah. never gone away but it was just it was all the tv that was available at the time mm -hmm. it was, yeah it was just i mean it, crushing. it makes you be aware of what you're being fed and makes the average viewer more savvy as to what filmmaking is go you know how how it how it works and and, and it's in a way you're not being mean that's what i love about joel is like it's not mean-spirited i mean he, these are how mm -hmm. how anyone gets a movie made is just beyond me. It is so hard. Anything that gets on a screen should be like, yeah, you did it, man, because uh, the agony <laughs> that it takes. Um, but it also, you know, it, it it it's a gentle humor of making fun of like, wow, that that was not good. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't feel you're not trying to shame anybody, and I think that's a fine line. And that kind of gentle humor, like I think. If you look at just humor in general, like it's not as kind as it used to be. I don't know. Maybe it was always like put down snarky, terrible humor, but um, it's it doesn't have a kindness underneath it. And I think that feels old fashioned. But at the end of the day, it's like what I love. It's what you know Joel loves. And 
and it's clever. And I think, you know, we, we're worth, we're, we deserve clever things. Well, I think back to, they were watching some Christmas movie, uh, probably Santa Claus versus the Martians. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they did a segment where they were um, doing presentations about Christmas past or something. And they were all so ugly and negative. And Joel was like, here's what Christmas parties were like in the 70s and secretaries uh, all but being assaulted at Christmas parties. And, they, <laughs> and, the, and the robots were just as bad. But Gypsy was there and Gypsy hadn't said anything. And they go, all right, Gypsy, what do you have? And she just opened her mouth and she had like a nativity set in her mouth and music was playing. And it was so... I mean, it's a great trick because it's like, yeah, she had the nativity set in her mouth the whole time. Of course. But it's like uh, the character who's the least vocal. Um, yeah, that's be that actually beautiful. Actually had mm -hmm. something so simple and, and it's like, yeah, like it just, it got me. And, and it, and I think that was the point is when their aggressions and, 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 and sense of frustration got too much at watching these movies. Yeah. Uh, that... Well, it is bad. I will tell you that I had to rift, uh, riff on munchies and it was probably the worst experience of my life. I almost <laughs> was like, I'm never writing for this show again. I'm just going to be an actor because it truly was. Dom DeLuise is one of the worst performers and God bless his corpse, but man, I nothing. There's something about him that I just could not stand. And it was this, it was like they just let him improv for like four hours and just put anything on screen and it was so like dated and just hard to riff because i think it's it's very hard to riff uh i think we were talking about this actually when we were riffing it's very hard to riff a comedy yes. because yeah it's just you can't do it and this munchies was a comedy so dom deloise only being dom not only being dom deloise but just being a comedy he's doing the self-aware stuff in the movie so how we do self-aware stuff so it was very very challenging um again yeah i would I would, I have to be like, what movie are you going to put me on? Cause I don't want to have another <laughs> munchy situation. So I wonder if being an actor and a writer makes you think differently about each lane. Oh, for sure. I mean, I think I have a hard time getting my writer hat off when I'm acting. And um, I think it's been a, a process to be like, Hey, what would I do with this versus like, Oh, let me look and see what the writer intended me to do. And I think, you know, it's important to honor the source material, but unless I'm bringing something to the role that nobody else is bringing, why am I doing it, right? So I think that's really important. And certainly all my writing is character motivated and I always put myself in the character's shoes and I always think about like, what would be a fun thing to see this person struggle with or uh, how do I wanna see them, you know, uh, navigate through life or what would I, what, what do I want to throw at this person? So, and, and, you know, I think that we're, for me, like, I mean, let's, for example, Game of Thrones, the last episode, we're all so mad at it because the characters didn't act like we thought they should. And I think we were all like, as a quorum, like, what, what happened here? Because it feels like the characters are acting completely differently than they have been established. And I think that really bothers us as people because we're there for the characters, right? I mean, mm -hmm. So um, thinking like the character, even if it's one line, you know, make sure that that's an authentic reaction to that, uh, that that person would have. I think that really helps as a writer. Yeah, well, after the battle with the Night King, um, Jon Snow gives an inspirational military speech, which he's the last character who would ever do that. No, and I know. The, the woman who wanted to rule the world quietly let the man talk. No, to inspire it was, the army and it's like no that's the, the, the uh i don't mind a surprise and characters can surprise but that's that's just that's just default to it's not what the character would do if i were an actor i'd be like what are what are we doing here i don't i mean i'm sure they did <laughs> there's no decision tree that would ever lead those characters to those choices <laughs> yeah and i and I, I i sympathize because again you have to end the series you have to get characters to a certain place and they just had to skip 15 steps to get there. Um, maybe that's the ending that George intends. I don't know. We don't know until we see it, but certainly it didn't organically get to that place. And characters can change, but you can't violate them or we're all just like, why are we here? Uh, yeah, so whatever. whatever. 
I think no. for me, the the one the one positive out of that is, yeah, George actually got to see that play out and go, now we can like, t- <laughs> all right, that that probably is not the ending. So let me. Yeah, no, he he has the advantage of like, oh, I see. I <laughs> they demoed that didn't really work. Um, so yeah, I can't wait to see how we get there. So you say writing is always a struggle, and I think that's for anything longer. I, I think that's usually the case, unless someone is churning out, I don't know, very formulaic stuff. But like if you're writing about whatever you're interested in and you're likely to be passionate about, it's going to bring new challenges to you, which means you kind of have to relearn, you have to learn how to become a new writer every time. Does that resonate with you? I mean, I seem to forget everything every time I pick up a pen, but I don't, I, I mean, again, my schedule, I have a child, I travel a lot for work, I act, I do gaming, you know, I don't ever stay on track and methodology enough to get a consistent workflow going. And that is to my detriment, because I do have other stories that will never be told because I just can't sit my butt in the chair. But at the end of the day, you know, at a certain point, I think, yeah, you got to have a plan, but you I think what held me back for a long time is reading a lot of screenplay, right? You know, and listening to how other writers work and um, not being able to work like that, not being able to wrap my brain around that methodology and then figuring out like, oh, I'm a messy writer. I don't know everything. I can't sit down and, you know, have it all planned out before I start writing. I have to kind of like have an idea and then sort of like noodle around to that point. And I'll be like, I got to back out and I got to figure out where I'm going. And it's, it's more like, um, as a video game, you know, analogy, like a fog of war, I got to go into the area and kind of like uncover (laughs) a little bit and then figure out where to go after that. But I have to get there because I can't just plan it. Um, so it is to the, again, to the detriment of my productivity and certainly as my being a professional writer, you can't do that, but I have, and I also have like such a rebellion against tropes. And anything that I've seen before, like I think screenwriters are very adept at being like, hey, there's that scene in Firefly where they did this or there was that scene in, you know, Rocky or uh, Jedi or whatever. Like they have such a vernacular of just like being able to lift a moment from another pre-existing piece and put it and solve a problem. I, I literally can't bring myself to do that. First of all, I don't remember things like well. And then second of all, if somebody's done it before, of course, I don't want to do it. I just this negative oppositional thing I have. And it certainly doesn't help me, but it gets the stories out the way I want them. And as long as I'm just doing it on the side where I don't have the pressure of having to produce like, you know, television, like every week, I'm fine with it. So you just, I think at the end of the day, you have to understand what kind of person you are and how you write and how do you find enjoyment, what process maximizes your enjoyment in a sort of painful process. Well, I have experienced creative people who produce work that I like, and then I see, oh, and this one was rushed, and the quality, like the the like, clearly the deadlines got the better of yeah, yeah, of the quality. So I'm going to pause it. Maybe you shouldn't feel guilty because your process works for you, and like I said, anytime your name is prominently on a project. I've always been excited by experiencing whatever that project is. So, Oh, that makes a lot. um, That that is a big compliment. I, you know, again, like I am, I'm more, I I kind of have figured out that I'm, I'm more like a sculptor than anything, you know, like I just, I get an idea or, and usually, especially a character like, you know, Laurel, the failed chosen one. And I start chipping away at the idea, you know, the tree or the piece of marble. And I'm like, well, does this need to go here? Oh no, let me go to the backside, chip away there. Let me do a little chipping here. And again, like I, I wish I could produce more, but um, I, I have to have it so perfect before I show it to anybody. Like, uh, you know, and I, again, that's to my detriment. It would be very good for me to be like in a writer's group and show people ugly work and be willing to write ugly. Um, and that's something I'm just trying to train myself to do, but at the end of the day, I have to have it like a little jewel box. Like, here you go. It's been four years. <laughs> so far, I think it's working out. And well, I, I do think there's something to be said for creative people who I hear from them when they have something important to say. 
Yes. As long as I can pay my bills in between, I'll take as long as I need to. (laughs) Unfortunately, that concern I have no advice for. Thank you. That's why I act and do lots of other things, right? To subsidize my jewel box writing technique. (laughs) And, you know, I think the the social aspects of of being creative is is also, for me, I find it surprisingly important. Mm -hmm. Like 20 years ago, I don't think I would have imagined how important having other people creating alongside me and sometimes, you know, collaborating, but just getting out of, of my head sometimes. Um, no, for sure. I have ne- I've yet to write a novel that's not nonfiction. I mean, that's my next goal after I do these stage play things. Um, but yeah, right now I'm working on a graphic novel and just seeing like some of the thumbnails come back and I'm like, oh, that's better than I thought it was going to be. And also having like Neil or Will perform a line in a way that I never expected. Like those, that the collaborative part of filmmaking, as long as I'm in charge of my own stuff, is such a joy because everybody additively makes it better. 